as you know, I used to work with Melissa Perry and I was recommending her book, Escaping the Build Trap. They were like, well, what's the general thesis here? And I said, the general thesis is always be focused on the most valuable thing you should be doing. And don't simply build something because you said you were going to build it. Be diligent about constantly reevaluating what is the most important thing we can be doing with time, which is incredibly valuable. Is it this or have we actually already accomplished something or did something change in the world, which means we need to change our proposed plan? Welcome to the Product Agility Podcast, the missing link between Agile and Product. The purpose of this podcast is to share practical tips, strategies, and stories from world-class thought leaders and practitioners. Why, I hear you ask. Well, I want to increase your knowledge and your motivation to experiment so that together we can create ever more successful products. My name is Ben Maynard, and I'm your host. What has driven me for the last decade to bridge the gap between agility and product is a deep-rooted belief that people and products evolving together can achieve mutual excellence. And we find ourselves here with Tammy Reese again for episode two of two. In this episode, Tammy is going to go much deeper on some of the topics where her expertise has really been founded. We're going to explore how you go from product to platform. We're going to look at promise cycles and why promise cycles are perhaps one of the things that really holds companies back. We are going to really then look at why Agile and product need to come together and how they can come together from the perspective of user stories. So sit tight, you're in for a fantastic episode with a whole heap of insights. Now, before you begin, what we ask is to take a moment, pick up your phone, get your keyboard in front of you and recommend this episode to a friend. You know it's going to be awesome, but don't bother waiting to listen to it. Just recommend it now. It would make me very happy, and it means that more people listen. The more people listen, the more popular we get, the more popular we get, the more interesting people we can get on here to share their stories and their insights with you. So that's enough from me. Enjoy the episode, and thank you very much for taking this time. Too often, teams get switched around project to project, and don't ever build the competency on a particular user group. Mm. Yes. Especially in larger organizations. And engineers hate nothing more than context switching, which is why you don't like to interrupt them in the middle of the day. But when it comes to an individual team and creating this nature of trust, as you said, you need clarity, which is the context of what we're trying to do, a clarified mission for the team. What is our team's purpose within this larger ecosystem we call a corporation what are we as a group trying to add value towards the larger business around who is it that we are going to serve how is it that we are going to serve them and with that definition you actually need in order to build competency to have multiple interactions in the same way we're trying to build trust earlier through building of a relationship to build that competency in your market, in your user needs, et cetera, you need to actually be invested in that for longer than a quarter. And so Ken <laughs> Sultan, who was the CPO over a diligent, really fantastic CPO, he organizes his teams generally, large international teams, whole cities worth of offices dedicated to a particular user group's problems. Because that allows for them to collaborate and really deep dive and become competent in who is it that we serve? How is it that we want to serve them potentially in an advanced fashion over time, hopefully in an advanced fashion over time, but rather than having teams that are constantly switching, it doesn't help. No, there's something which comes from uh, a particular approach. I says I've, have been known for in the past, which is a large scale scrum. And it's this idea that we don't want to build product groups that are specialized in, in the technical domain. Rather, we want to build them so they're specialized in the customer or user domain. So that switching of teams between different types of users or customers, if you're just working on database or API or front end, then like I totally get why someone would be like, oh well, yeah, go and do that, go and do that. We need to be moving forward. You know, go do that, go do that, because you're just working on a technical thing. But then that's exhausting and it's crap because you never get anywhere. I think everything just goes yeah. so slow. 
The teams didn't build up any empathy. The teams don't feel good because you can't connect into the purpose. If I'm working on any, like generally speaking, for anything other than the front end or some kind of front end testing, I'm going to build no real understanding or empathy for the customers. I'm never going to see the fruit of my labor. Someone else is going to take the glory for that at some point in the future when everyone else finishes their stuff. And I think that's such a tragedy. So I love that. I love what you were saying. Who was the name of that person that was organizing their company around that's user insulting. problems? Ken. Or Ken now. Nice. Yes. He was at Diligent at the time. He may still be there, but I don't believe so. If you just heard what Ben said and you said, but platform teams are a whole separate thing and they're just dedicated to the technology. They're not dedicated to user groups. I disagree with you. Yeah. And I want to state right now, platform teams users are the internal other teams within a company that are building on top of that. If you are DevOps and platform of your company, you are building the infrastructure and your users are the developers of either your internal teams or external third parties that are building on top of your platform. There is a yeah. user group, and there's probably two in those major groups, and you have to understand their needs and you have to understand how you are advancing the business as well. I agree. I, cool. Maybe we could... If we have time, we can kind of delve a bit deeper on some um, – because I've got, I've got two or three things in my head. But on the platform side of it, that I think you're absolutely correct, and there was a great talk by someone who I can't remember. I will do my best to get it in the show notes. When she was explaining that the platform that she runs, she is having to do multi, like two or three-tier discovery because she has got the internal users, but they in turn serve external users. And it, sometimes they serve other people as well. So for her, it isn't just a case of like, just can't understand my internal users. There's limited value in that really, because they're just telling me what they think their customers want. Actually, if I'm going to have a solid platform, which people are going to use consistently, and I can evolve it in the right way, I've actually got to kind of go a few tiers beyond that, which means that for me, as she was saying, road mapping is really tough when you have that many people involved. I thought it was a very enlightening talk and it's a, a topic which I'm particularly yeah. interested in. And the um, same goes if your platform so, is being used by third parties because the developers that are coding against your APIs, they're doing it for a purpose which their internal business stakeholders have told them. They need an app that does something unique. They need something else that the the core product isn't delivering, whether it's an extraction of data or something else. And so you need to actually also talk to whoever it is that's giving them instruction to understand what problems are they trying to solve. It isn't and here's the hardest part. You have to decide if those problems are aligned with your business mission, vision, goals, et cetera. Because simply because someone else has a problem doesn't mean you are the group to solve it. Yeah. So take, for example, a platform called ArcXP. It was part of the Washington Post. Okay. And then when, oh, Mr. Bez when Mr. Bezos took them over, he came in and said, that thing you're, you're doing there, that, col that collection of things you're doing there, that's really quite marketable. And so I've got a podcast episode, which I think would be coming out after this one. It, with one of their product managers and their director of portfolio. Yeah. And fascinating conversation. They're doing phenomenally well, but they, one of the hypotheses that I've always run with, just because I've seen it, I say, is it a hypothesis? Because I've observed it. I'm not sure. But one of my observations is if you're running a platform and you've got a platform which is serving ex people external to the organization, but also internal, and they're effectively the same type of user, but you've got internal versus external, but actually being able to prioritize the demands between those two disparate groups, the, the internal people, like maybe because the money is all coming through them anyway, it's really hard to get that balance. So what ArcXP did, yeah, they just split it out as a separate company. And it exists yeah. as a separate entity, and they're doing they're doing phenomenally well, but they've structured their products around their user groups. Interestingly, one of the user groups are developers at other organizations who are accessing it through the API. So they've yeah. actually kind of specialized in the technical domain, but they're because their users are technical in that instance, that makes sense for them. And, I thought, and then the other one is around uh, content creation, effectively. And I thought that's just really fascinating the way that you've got that structured from a platform perspective. It made a lot of sense to me. 
I mean, if your platform is the product, there's probably at some point going to be a portfolio of products within your platform that have specialized mm. user groups and needs. And not only technology, because Conway's law, what you were talking about is Conway's law, the nature that mm -hmm. your technology will reflect your organizational structure. And in reality, what you want to be able to do is exactly that, which Washington Post did, which is you want your technology to be so centered around a user group and its problems that if that becomes a large enough need and a large enough user group, it could be its own product as opposed mm. to just piece of the product. Do you know anybody or any artifacts that have put some definition around platform versus product versus a platform with products or a platform as a product? Because I, I, I've noticed in so many different nuances in the people that I speak to and the people that I work with around these and everyone's called them different things. And I've kind of been working on my own language around this, but do you know anyone that's actually defined like maybe what some of these things could be? I'm guessing it isn't, yeah, you know, it isn't a short document probably, but is there something you know of? I know I have a draft of something at some point. Um, <laughs> I was like, did I publish it? Never publish it. But now you're making me want to. But I was lucky enough that my best friend started working at Salesforce in 2005. And so hmm. I've always known, or at least the last 18 years, known about platform products and why they are different and how they can scale in different ways. And hmm. fortunately, so many B2B companies don't understand the opportunity, which is platform, but I actually know where I have this in my strategy primer, which I can share with everybody. Towards the end, there is a slide set, which is around the 16 strategies for growth. And one of the strategies for growth is to become a platform. Yeah. And so if we look at the become a platform one, so platform in general, to be clear, is the idea that you are not going to be the only group of people that are creating products using your technology. Mm -hmm. Because you understand, and this is if your platform is a product, Yeah, you understand that your internal teams can only provide so much technology solutions out there. and. There are fringes out there which have more unique needs, and it is better that you instead open up your platform with its core functionality to other organizations so they can produce solutions. So in the slide I have, which has become an open platform, the examples we have are Salesforce, Slack the App Store, and Epic Healthcare. I don't know how much people know about Epic Healthcare, but it's a huge electronic medical records company. And so if you think about the nature of electronic medical records, they are similar to Salesforce in that they are this core database. But if you run a specialized kind of practice in acupuncture or something, you their user flow may not be fully functional for you, but you they have opened up APIs that allow for developer resources to build out customized experiences for unique needs. And so tips to achieve success if you're creating an open platform product are to establish API and developer resources. So often documentation is too poor. When you are creating an open platform, that is not a good option. To, you must actually invest in good documentation and resources for developers to learn about your platform and how to use it. Co-develop your first few integrations with select groups of people. So if you know about how Slack created their platform, they showcased a few integrations they had already created with key partners that they knew would add value to their community of users that they did not want to build. And then be sure that other companies you actually request them to build things that aren't part of your company's core value proposition. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And so here are the situations where this is the best option. So you should think about doing an open platform when you when your product itself can be a hub for many other business or social functions. When your company potentially is the source of truth for a type of data for a business or organization. And when network effects can be leveraged, meaning that you could potentially even create not just an open platform, but potentially a marketplace where the people who are developing those unique pieces of functionality for fringe groups can be acquired or purchased or rented by other user groups within your your customer base so that your product becomes even more valuable because other people have created these side offshoots, mm-hmm. which is the force.com platform. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I agree with everything you say. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with everything you say. I, I, there's a. Which is different, that, by the way, that's very different than the platform internal group. But. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why I think that this is a, this is the mistake. I think, I think it's a mistake or maybe suboptimal, maybe it isn't a mistake, but when people internally call something a platform when it, when it isn't, and all they're doing is then making a dependency on everyone else to them rather than saying, actually, this is a thing. So the classic one I'll use, and I've got someone coming on the podcast, a guy called Duncan, talk about some of this. Is an organization that where I met Duncan where they were creating a platform around identity and access management. So it's a big organization, hundreds of thousands of people in finance, heavily regulated. They have many different financial kind of services and applications, et cetera. And because everyone was dealing with access in many different ways, from a regulatory standpoint, it was very hard for them to say, yes, we are still regulatory compliant. Here is the evidence for that. And sometimes the security wasn't that great. It was a bit... It is a bit flaky and they were like, we can't keep on doing it this way. So we're going to go on a long journey and we're going to create identity and access management as a platform. So that anyone in, the, in this organization that wants to have a login and 2FA and exit or biometrics can just come on, they can use it. And then they will get the they will get it in a, in a standardized way, which means that we can still go to the regulators and say we're valid. And then actually when the regulations changed and we can make the changes and, and it goes through to everyone else. I thought that makes sense to me as a platform because not yes. everyone was doing it, doing it and not everyone was doing it consistently well. So splitting that out into a platform in that context, do you know that makes sense to me rather than everyone going off and doing it on their own. The, yes. the opposite to that is when people take something, which actually people, lots of people are doing and they are doing it kind of consistently well but instead of then saying, actually, how do we kind of are they let other people kind of get involved in what we're doing and just and minimize the dependencies on us, they just want to extract it out as a separate platform and say, do you know what? We're going to have this as a platform and maximize everyone's dependencies on us. And data has always been an interesting one in organizations. When they take yeah. out data as a platform and all they do then is make it slower for everyone to get what they want. And then all of a sudden they can't put in what they want about going through a massive change process and then guess what it's never right anyway and all they do with that rather than slowly address the complexity of their organization and say okay let's solve the problems that we have around data in this way they say oh what will solve the problem let's take out and call it its own thing then magically those problems will disappear oh no wait they haven't now everything's just really slow and crap yes and that gets back to starting with why right why do we think we need to do anything right? How does this help us, right? Why is this going to be something that adds value to the way we do things? And platform teams, to be clear, can add a lot of value because they can make other teams more efficient. They can standardize things that developers shouldn't have to do again and again and again, right? And at the same point, if they aren't actually doing that, then they aren't succeeding in their mission and their metrics for success. Yeah. At which point you have to reevaluate. You do. And none of these are absolutes, you know, I think that is, hopefully that is clear to people. There are absolutely situations where what we're saying, some of you say might not be true, but yeah, I think it is. This is all a big. So going back to the why thing, and you mentioned, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes ago about 
building context and spending time at the beginning of a new piece of work, build the context, let people understand the why, build some relationships and really kind of focus on having people informed about the context. I thought it was an interesting, uh, uh, interesting, interesting side avenue to take on that is just in case anybody was wondering and also to test my understanding on this, Tammy, is that what we're not saying here is get everyone in a room for a week to plan out three months of work ahead. No, definitely not. That is not what I am saying. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make sure because obviously that's what PI planning is in SAFE. No, what I'm saying is during your kickoff meeting, your inception meeting for the next six weeks of work or whatever it is, invest 15 to 30 minutes discussing the current mission of the company and vision of the company, what the goals are for the next quarter, year, et cetera, what your team's piece of achieving that goals are, who it is that you serve as a group of customers, what their current problems are that are not yet met, and which of those problems you are now going to try to meet. And then you can then say, this is our proposal for how we're trying to meet it. And I'm using that word very specifically. It's proposal, not plan. This is our proposal. Now that everybody understands the context, this is the best way we, the three, four people who have come up with the idea, think we should move forward. We're now offering it to the larger group as a proposal. Tell us what is good or bad about this so that collectively we can own what it is we're going to choose to build. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love, it. love it. Love it. And I love it okay. extra. But I loved it. I would have loved it anyway. I love it a bit extra because it's actually one of, that's kind of the basis for an alternative user story format that I antagonize people with. Because mm -hmm. I just, I hate that as a, I want say that. I think it's just so rubbish. What do you prefer? I prefer... Something that starts with like as a, or just the person or the person, don't mind the persona, in order to do something differently and actually explain what that different thing is they would like to do. Start, stop, continue, do faster, do slower, whatever it may be. And then the next line is we propose. Mm. Because I don't think that in a, in a conversation around it, someone's like, yeah, if you go, I totally understand that people say as an operations user, I want this. Okay, great. Wait, absolutely. You want that solution and let us help you evolve that. No, I want this. Okay. Yeah. But surely yeah, this, I, the, the, this I know, but it, but it, but this is like, I think yeah. uh, all too often that's how people use it. So I just say, okay, do you know what? In order to, how about if we say we propose, so let's get together and let's work together on a proposal for how we think we can help you do that thing differently. And for me, that just like, Often what people turn around and say is, oh, so we actually have to talk to the to the user. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I have to talk to the user or or the closest you can get to that person because, you know, they're kind of the person that's kind of going to be receiving it. Yeah. I even like just adding, instead of writing acceptance criteria, just writing proposed acceptance criteria. Mm -hmm. Not optional, but proposed. This was our best guess when we wrote this down. Things will have yeah. probably changed between when I typed it up and you opening it. Mm -hmm. And well, it, 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 allowing for that space of change and agility. Not this story isn't defined as complete unless you do all of these things. But mm -hmm. this is what I propose when I put this in. Open it. If you don't think the proposition is correct anymore, talk to me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like to see people either the users or customers or the best opportunity we've got for someone to represent them actually using the things al along the process of creating it. Either if you're working in sprints, like throughout the sprint or at a sprint review, if you're working in some other mechanism like Kanban, just having the evidence that, you know, it, the person's used it and they're happy. And guess what? If they're happy, and they're, yeah, that, that enables it for me. And this ends up being totally different acceptance criteria. I don't really care, particularly if they're like, yeah, buy that. that that works for me. That's worth its weight in gold. I don't think people have. So, there's not enough of that. 
yeah, there isn't enough of that. So as you know, I used to work with Melissa Perry and I was recommending her book, Escaping the Build Trap, to someone. And I they were like, well, what's the general thesis here? And I said, the general thesis is always be focused on the most valuable thing you should be doing and don't simply build something because you said you were going to build it, right? <laughs> be diligent about constantly reevaluating what is the most important thing we can be doing with our resources, which are time, which is incredibly valuable. Is mm -hmm. it this or have we actually already accomplished something or did something change in the world, which means we need to change our proposed plan? Yeah. Proposals over promises. I like it. Yeah. I've been mulling over this idea of promise cycles. Okay. Which is how, how long in your organization are you forced to make a promise for? So I, are you having Ooh. to promise on a weekly basis or a daily basis or a monthly? Because then what I find is that you go into organizations and they will say, oh, no, I know we want to really embrace product. We want to be product led and we know we're a tech, a tech based firm and we know we're doing things in one way, but we really, we really believe in this, really want to do it. It's great. Okay, so how often are your your leadership teams, your executives, making promises to the market, shareholders, private equity people, whoever it is? How often are they making promises? Oh, they make promises once a year. Okay, when did they make their last promise? Two months ago. Okay, well, tap, give me a call in eight months. When actually that promise cycle is coming to an end, because my guess is that it's going to be hard to convince them to change their promises now. But give me a call in eight months when things aren't working out and you know that promises need to be different next time. And then maybe, then we can yeah, we can perhaps do some interesting stuff, but getting involved at this point, so early on in the promise cycle, unless they're willing to change their promises, then I'm not sure what we're going to be able to do. So I just, it's just something I've been mulling over. Because I, I, I say it's a common... Yeah, I, just, I think that's a really interesting core correlative item to what Marty Kagan calls high integrity commitments, with, which is the idea that a group of engineers, product, empowered teams, et cetera, cannot predict everything. There's no way to know what's going to happen when they start writing the code, et cetera, in a perfect sense. Mm -hmm. But if you've done your homework enough, you should be able to say, in certain instances, we can, with confidence and our own integrity, commit that this will happen by this date. Mm -hmm. But that is reserved for unique instances and should not be the rule. Mm -hmm. And so what I find interesting about what you're talking about is that really what needs to happen is a cultural shift where sales executives and product and engineering choose a certain amount of things they're going to promise or commit to the market that is being done with a, with a good amount of knowledge, both around the market need and what is feasible or possible from an engineering perspective. And that that should not be your entire plan or proposed plan, but should be a segment of that. Mm. And the rest of it is the more agile portion. Yeah. It's like your, your promising capacity. Yeah. Promise, and also, promise, what the hell is that? You should, you should be capacity. agile. Like the nature of your promise should also allow for agility. That it's, we promise mm. we will provide better reporting solutions. That doesn't say we're going to build a particular report around a particular thing. Just our reporting is going to get better. Mm -hmm. My hope for this conversation, Tammy, was at some point I'd get that feeling in my stomach that was like oh okay there's like there's something new it's quite interesting and okay. and i had that feeling i had that feeling when you started talking oh i i like that thank you you're welcome i hope you had a number of those feelings pop up as we were talking <laughs> yeah, yeah there was a bit, that was the, that was the that was the main one though you know because I, I i respect you like deeply i think you're 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 brilliant at what you do and so it's always, you know, the level of like intimidation when you get people on the podcast and you want to have a talk because 
yeah, there's like some awesome people out there and you're one of them. So to, yeah, it's better have this conversation with you and feel like, you know, there's been an exchange of ideas and there's you know, and like my thoughts have moved on and I've got some new ideas. It's really nice. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope that we spread new ideas across the globe and then we can run a conference and even more that. people can have new ideas. We're doing a conference. Shit, I've said it. I can edit that out. Maybe we won't do a conference. Tammy's coming to London next year to talk at a conference. <laughs> Maybe it'll just be a meetup. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it'll be easy to organise if it is just you. <laughs> I mean, if it's just a meetup, is that what you're doing? I know, I know. We've had big, I've had conversations with someone that works for me yesterday about do we do a meetup or what do we do? And I'm just like, oh, let's see. But I think a product agility conference would be an interesting thing even though i know it's a lot of hassle to arrange but tammy we've been talking for a good chunk of time and i don't want to yes. keep you any longer than Thank i have and then perhaps you would like to stay so maybe we bring this to a close but before we do before we do is that what do you think is there anything else that we should end is there something we should end on yes Earlier, I mentioned that I don't read books very often. And on that basis, if I recommend a book, you should know that it is probably pretty good and helpful. And over the past, I don't know how many months, I've been slowly working my way through Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference. Chris Voss, for those of you Uh, who are less familiar with him, is a former chief negotiator in hostage situations for the Federal Bureau of Investigations in the United States. He teaches around the world nowadays around negotiation tactics. And I believe that this should become a core book for all product managers because what it teaches you is not about compromise, but about knowing what is right and figuring out how to talk with other people to achieve that right thing. And I think too often when it comes to product management, like that platform person you were talking about, Hmm. we have lots of competing interests and we try to find compromise and try to make everybody a little bit happy. And in reality, that never makes anybody really happy. Yeah. And so he deals with very practical advice about how to talk with other people so that they feel heard, so they feel true empathy for their situation, and so that they can develop empathy for your situation, and that you can come to a common collaborative conclusion together, hopefully more aligned with your goals than theirs. But yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. People need not listen to the blink, but they should go and buy the book. I, I, it's, I've, I haven't bought it. I, I listened to it on Blinkist and I enjoyed it. Yeah. But I need to, like the, the books behind me, you can see this, it's deceptive yeah. because I get through them very slowly. So slowly. I passed about the person <laughs> who talked about reading techniques. I will listen to it. I will. No, it was, yeah, a guy called Noel Warnell. Uh, Noel is a lovely person and he does a great job at, do you know, he, he says about changing your relationship with books and the biggest takeaway that I got and it's, I don't know, I think I'd heard this before, but I hadn't paid attention, was that you know, we're, we're trained at a young age to read books from beginning to end. But most of the books that we are going to read don't have to be read that way. No. And then he just goes on to give loads of, tip, loads of tips and tricks as to how you can kind of break it down and how you can just kind of consume it. And he actually runs a, a cohort program where he teaches people all these, te- all these techniques in depth. So I'll send you a link. Before we end up down another rabbit hole, Thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on. It's been an absolute joy. And I really hope that one day we actually get to meet in person. Sounds I think lovely. Thank you from the of top of my heart for inviting me along. Hey, it's a whole, it's a whole heart episode. Whole heart episode. <laughs> you started at the end. I went back to the beginning. Ah, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Now, before I start crying, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Tammy, for coming along. If people want to find out more about you, I will put some information about you in the show notes. 
But is there anything I suppose you wanted to you wanted to mention or plug whilst we got you here? You have a lot of European folk, yeah? Yeah. So listen. So I will yeah. actually be in Lisbon for the productized conference in October, mm-hmm. giving my speech around the only three questions you need and running a workshop that Andre and I have not yet chosen, but I will plug the productized conference because we've talked so much about conferences and the need for product centric ones. And this is one that's in your backyard. So awesome in Lisbon. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm going to, I'm going to check that out. Okay. I'm looking down the list of who's there. Some garlic. There you are. Hello, Tammy. Ah, it's a strong lineup. It's a strong lineup. Interesting. Strong lineup. They haven't done it in um, three years, so I think there are a lot of people who they had like waitlisted to come speak. And yeah. Ah, well, that's fantastic. Now, Andre would be very proud of me that I plugged it. Thank you. Productize is a. Sounds like a great conference, strong lineup. I'll put a link in there and we'll probably do some uh, promotion for it anyway because it looks like a good conference. Tammy, once again, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you thank for listening you. and we will, you, you will hear from us again soon. Cool. Bye, everybody. And so ends the episodes with Tammy Reese. There was two of them and I thank you for listening to them both. I am certain that you've gained so many insights from listening to Tammy's reflections on product and platform of us talking about promise cycles about looking at all kinds of facets of both product and agile and really trying to bring the world of product agility together one thing we could ask you to do is to leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice whether that be itunes spotify whatever it is leaving reviews helps to increase our visibility to the people that matter which are the new guests that we can bring on so if you like what you hear leave us a review it will enable us to entice on a lot of those guests that maybe we've been had our arm for a little while but maybe thinking that we're maybe not quite there yet and we'd like to let them know that we are and we're ready and waiting to share their insights and their stories with you our listeners so thank you once again for listening i'm ben maynard and this is the product agility podcast